Hello, everyone, and welcome to Algebra 2, Section 4.1 and 2 Continued. Today, we're going to do something that at first glance looks really easy. But then when we actually try and do the problems, you might find it's a little tricky, but you guys are smart. You can do it. So we're going to be talking about where a function is increasing and decreasing. And at first glance, you might say, well, that's not so bad. It's definitely increasing here. And actually, it's increasing again there. But then it's decreasing in this little section. And if that's what you thought, you would be exactly right. What makes this section difficult is that we don't want to look at it in terms of the y coordinates. We want to look at it and describe it in terms of the x coordinates. And that's what I'm going to show you how to do today. So my, I always tell kids that the best plan, at least in the beginning, is to delineate the sections where it's increasing or decreasing with something like a highlighter or a colored pencil. So I'm going to take my highlighter here and I'm just going to mark that spot. The function to the left of this is increasing and then it's decreasing and then I get to that point but I'm not going to mark it down there. I'm going to mark it the whole section of graph and then after that highlighted mark then it's going to start increasing again. Now the key is when you go to describe this graph you want to describe it in terms of x. So I'm going to start over here, always start on the left, and I'm actually going to draw my line on the x-axis. So where is my function increasing? It's increasing to the left of negative 1. So when x is less than negative 1. And then it's also increasing again starting here, notice I stay on the x-axis. Even though I'm looking at this entire section and how it goes up, if you draw the answer on the x-axis, then you're more likely to get it right. So it's also increasing at x is greater than 1. And I know it looks funny that I wrote or instead of and because it can't be both places at the same time. So it's increasing if x is less than negative 1 or if x is greater than 1. If you say and, that there is no x that is both less than negative 1 and greater than 1. So we use the or in math. Where is the function decreasing? So again, I see the function is decreasing here, but instead of drawing it there, I'm going to say between here and here, this interval that I had used the highlighter for, that's where it's decreasing. How can I describe that in terms of x? I can say negative 1 is less than x is less than 1. And that's easiest to do if you're drawing right on the interval. Same thing is true for end behavior. As x approaches infinity, so as that just means as x gets bigger and bigger. So x just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger when I go in this direction. That's considered going to infinity. And what is the y doing? Remember that f of x is just the same thing as y. So what is y doing? y is also getting bigger and bigger and bigger right? So we say it's going to infinity. And as x goes to negative infinity, so we'll say gets smaller. Or some people like to think of it as moves left on the number line. So I'm going in this direction now. I'm moving left on the number line. What is the graph doing? Meaning what is f of x doing? Remember, f of x is just another name for y. What is the y value doing? It's going down. It's, it's getting, it's negative 4, negative 10, negative 100. It's going to negative infinity. So I realize this is, can be a little bit tricky, so we are going to do the next two together. For each of the following, describe the end behavior of the graph and the x values for which the function is increasing or decreasing. And then we're actually going to add something new. 
uh, the x values for which the function is greater than or less than zero. But let's start with, let's practice the two that we've already worked on. So I'll do, just because it said it for part A, they want to know what is the function doing f of x, well actually I'll write it the way they did, as, as x goes to infinity, f of x goes to what? So that means just as you look over here, so I just kind of go to the end of the graph. You can call that infinity, even though it's, it's only five. But if I kept going, what is the y value doing? The y is going down. So the answer is negative infinity. As x approaches negative infinity, where is that? That's kind of over here, right? So as you're going in this direction, what is the y value doing? What is f of x doing? On that side, it's going down to negative infinity. On both sides, it's negative infinity. It's going down. So this just means when you go to the right, what is the graph doing? It's going down, so you write negative infinity. And when you go this way, it's going down, so you write negative infinity. If you don't get it yet, well, get it by another couple examples. Then it says, what are the x values for which the function is increasing and decreasing? So again, I'm going to take my highlighter, and I can see that it's increasing till there, so I'm going to mark that spot. And then it's decreasing. But I need to think of it in terms of the x values. So from negative infinity until, what is that, negative 4, it's increasing. So f of x, the y value, is increasing for x is less than negative 4. So for all these values, you're just looking at that on a number line. Think about that. If you were drawing a number line, wouldn't you write x is less than negative 4? That's what that is on the number line. And that's where the function is increasing. Where is f of x decreasing? For x is greater than negative 4. OK, I am going to come back to part C. I just want to really make sure you got parts A and B down. A. As x goes to infinity, so I'm looking way over here, and over here, and over here, and over here. As x gets bigger and bigger and bigger, what is the y value doing? It's either going up to infinity or down to negative infinity. It's going up to infinity. As x goes to negative infinity, which is a fancy way of saying as I go in this direction, what is f of x doing? What is the graph doing? f of x, remember, means the y value, or it just means the graph. f of x is going down, so I'm going to write negative infinity. Part b, I want to know where it's increasing or decreasing. So I'm going to mark it with a highlighter. So there's an increasing section, and now there's a decreasing section. And now there's an increasing section, so I'm going to have three different answers for this. But I think it's easier to mark them as little intervals. And then you're going to look at those just like you would read any other number line. So f of x is increasing for this section, everything on this side of the purple line. So for x is less than, and that's just negative 1, or it's also increasing here. And even though you think of increasing as like this, I need to look at it on the x-axis for x is greater than 1. And then f of x is decreasing through this section. So what is that on the x-axis? For negative 1 is less than x is less than 1. Okay. All right, now I'm going to introduce something a little bit new. This time it says for part C, 
it says, tell me where the, tell me the x values for which f of x, remember that just means y, is greater than zero. So if I were making a table, when would I get a positive y? What about if x is negative 8? What is y? Um, we're counting by 2s. 2, 4, 6, 8. I can't even see it. Maybe negative 10? Let's do one that we can see. So when x is negative 7, what is the y? It's right there at negative 4. I want to know where the y is greater than 0. Well, I can figure out where the y is equal to 0. At negative 6, y is equal to 0. What about at negative 4? At negative 4, the y is 4. That's the spot I'm looking for. But there's actually a whole range of spots. So again, you don't actually want to make a table for this. Instead, you just have to look at it in terms of, at least I use a highlighter. So for this whole section over here, the y values are down underneath. And then for this whole section here, the y values are underneath. The only place where the y values are above the x-axis are right there. But that's not going to really help me if I need to describe it in terms of x. So again, there's going to be three answers because there's three sections. So where is the y value less than 0? f of x is less than 0 for um, x is less than negative 6, or x is greater than 2, for once, uh, negative 2. Once you get to negative 2, it, they're all negative values again. And f of x is greater than 0, so the y value is above the axis, for negative 6 is less than x is less than negative 2. So for this little section on your x-axis. If you would like to try the next section on your next one on your own, part C on this one, you can see if you can get it. I am going to do it for you. So again, I'm looking to see where this graph is above the x-axis or below the x-axis. So I've drawn a little line here. You can see it. I guess I did it in the highlighter last time. Right there where this graph changes all down here. Look, it's below the x-axis. And then all of a sudden, right at that line, it's above the x-axis. So how do we define that? We define it in terms of x. So for this whole section, it's below the x-axis. And then for this section, it's above the x-axis. So f of x is greater than 0 above the x-axis for x is greater than, and that's 2, just like that. And then f of x is less than 0, it's below the x-axis, for all the x is less than 2. Now I will say this one has a little bit of a catch. I'm not going to give you anything that's meant to be tricky like this, but this actually isn't the answer. And that's only because right at negative 1, it's equal to 0. And this specifically asked, when is it less than 0? So you can either add a little x is not equal to negative 1. That would kind of clear that up. You want all the x's less than 2, but you don't want x is negative 1. Or if you really want to get ready for some higher level math, you will be doing it this way in the future. You would say for x is less than negative 1, or from negative 1 to 2. This would be the, technically the correct answer. Um, but like I said, I'm not going to give you one where I throw in a little tiny point where it's actually equal to 0 just to mess you up. Basically, I want you to understand how to express things in terms of x. So this one asks you to make up your own. Give an example of a polynomial function, f of x, such that the y value goes down. That's how you just have to think about that. The y goes down as x approaches infinity. 
not down didn't work out, did it? Goes down as x approaches infinity. So on the right. So I'm thinking about a graph that goes down on the right hand side. And f of x approaches infinity. That means that y goes up as x approaches negative infinity. And this would be on the left hand side of the graph. So we want something where y goes up on the left. There you go. Give it a little curvature and you got yourself an answer. So a negative cubic function. You might write y is equal to negative x cubed. You could add some other pieces to it. Doesn't really matter because this function is going to be a cubic function that ends down and that's what it's going to look like. Okay. This one's pretty hard. Again, if you would like to turn this video off, this is like a little bit of a puzzle. I actually think it's a little bit fun. I am going to walk you through it, but if you could figure this out on your own, you're, you're just going to do so much better this year the more times you stop this video and try and do things on your own. Sketch a graph of the polynomial function f if f is increasing when x is less than negative 1 and between 0 and 1. So I need it increasing before negative 1. So here's negative 1. So I want it increasing. And I want it increasing from 0 to 1. So in this little section, I want it increasing also. So it's increasing, and then it's increasing again. Okay. It's decreasing from negative 1 to 0. So might as well connect it, right? In this section, it's decreasing and greater than 1. Ha oh, ha! I'm so excited. I look like I got it, right? Ah. And f of x is less than 0. The y value is less than 0 for all the numbers. Well, I just plotted 1, 1 and 3 quarters. That y value is definitely not less than 0. How can we fix this? I can move my graph down. I can still have it be increasing and then decreasing and then increasing. And I, I don't even have to make it so symmetric. Um, and then increasing and then decreasing. So I did the same thing. I increased until I got to x is negative 1, and I increased again from 0 to 1. I decreased in those other two spots, but I made sure that my y was less than 0 for the whole thing. So that blue answer was wrong. So you have to, you know, it's a, like I said in the beginning, it's a little bit of a puzzle. Okay. Will your graph look exactly like this? No. Another possibility is it's increasing like this. It gets to that point. Maybe it comes down and then it increases again. And it could be, it could look like that. But it has the same basic concept that it's increasing until x is negative 1 and then it's decreasing from 0 to 1, increasing again from 0 to 1, and then decreasing after that. And all the y values are less than 0. Describe the degree. So it is a 1, 2, 3, 4. It is an x to the fourth. Degree is 4. And the leading coefficient must be negative. We know that because it ends down. All right, I hope you're able to figure out that puzzle. All right, very something very fun now. This is called Pascal's Triangle. I would love for you to look at it. If we were in class, I would have everybody be trying to guess the next row. So it goes 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 1, 3, 3, 1, 1, 4, 6, 4, 1. I'll give you the next row. It's 1, 5, 10, 10, 5, and then one. Did you figure it out? Okay, I'll do the last row for you and I will tell you the answer. So if you don't want to know yet, quick turn off your video. It goes one, and then you add the two numbers that you're going to write the number between. So one plus five is six. And then five plus 10 is 15. And 10 plus 10 is 20. So if you look at that's how they always did it. The two and the one made the three. 10 plus five is 15. 5 and 1 make 6, and then you always put a 1 at either end. So 
it's not just cool, it's beyond cool because this is what it does. You guys may remember that I've harped on this a little bit, that if you have x plus y squared, it is not, not, not x squared plus y squared. You cannot distribute the square. You have to do x plus y times x plus y, which gives you first, outer, inner, last, which is x squared plus 2xy plus y squared. So I've talked about this in detail. But even though you can't take this shortcut, which everybody wants to take, there is still a shortcut. And that is that you can use Pascal's triangle to get this answer. If you have something squared, you can go down to the row with the two in it, and those are the coefficients. So this is gonna be one a squared plus two, because we're on that row, a b, plus one b squared. Look what ours came out to be. One x squared plus two xy plus one y squared. So this next one on the third row is going to be one a cubed plus three, because I'm using this row now, there's going to be four terms, one, three, three, one. And if you're wondering how to get the rest of it, it's actually very cool. The a's are going to count down and the b's are going to count up. So the a was cubed, now it's squared, now it's just an a, and then there's not going to be any a's in this last term. And there were no b's, and then one b, and then two b's, and then b cubed. Wasn't that better than doing a plus b times a plus b times a plus b? It's very cool. Um, Obviously, to the first power, anything to the first power is just a plus b. It didn't really affect it. But that's why it's just 1 plus 1, 1a one and 1b, just to show you the Pascal's triangle works. And even the zeroth row works. Anything to the zero power is 1. And that's why you get a 1 on the top. So how can we use this to do this one? Okay. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to... Each one of these is going to have three parts. So first, we're going to write our coefficients. Since it's the row with the five, I'm going to write these. I know it's going to be one plus five, and I'm going to need a lot of room because it's going to have a lot of, it's actually going to have six terms. Uh, ten, ten, five, one. That kind of sets the stage for you. And then, like I said, this one is going to count down. So g to the fifth, g to the fourth, g to the third, g squared, g, and then no g's. Okay? And then the six is going to do the opposite. No sixes. One six. Two sixes. Three sixes. Four sixes. And then five sixes. I should have put a plus in between to just delineate them a little bit better. Now, you can't leave it that way. We would never leave it that way. You always want to put the whole coefficient in there correctly. So this is going to be g, g to the fifth, plus, and then I'm going to combine these two. Remember, if you have four times, five times four times three, um, or let's make that something simple. 5 times x times 3. You wouldn't leave it like that. You would change it to 15x. Same is true down here. I'm going to make this 30 g to the fourth. And then 6 squared is 36 times 10 is 360 g to the third. 6 cubed is 216 times 10 is 2160 g squared. Ooh, I might have to get out my calculator for this next one. And then 6 to the 4th, I think. No, maybe I don't know. It. 36 times 36 is, oh, no, just G, yeah, G to the 4th is 1,296 times the 5. So this piece right here is 1,296, but I still need to multiply it by the 5 which gives me 
6,480g to the first, and then plus 6 to the fifth, which is 7,776. Now this was still a lot of work, but it was so much better than doing g plus 6 times g plus 6 times g plus 6. So when you go to take your quiz, you have a timed quiz. One, two, three, four, five, that's it. You have to choose between multiplying two of these together, then multiplying it by the third one, then multiplying these two together, and multiplying that by that, or learning how to do this. I highly recommend you learn how to do this. I will show you another one. So this one's only to the third power. So I know I'm going to be looking at row three of my Pascal's triangle. It's not really row three. It's really one, two, three. It's row four. It's the one with the threes in it, I should say. So my coefficients are one, three, three, one. So let's do them this way to mark off our coefficients, OK? So now this is going to count down from cubed. So 3x cubed, 3x squared, 3x to the first, and then no 3x's. This one is going to have no 5's, and then 1 5, and then 2 5's, and then 3 5's. I know it's not easy. Hang in there. So I'm going to simplify this to 27x cubed. You can distribute to factors. It's only to terms that you can't distribute. This is not x squared plus y squared. But x times y squared is x squared y squared. This is a really a fact that people struggle with right through calculus. So make sure you get this down. All right, this one has a little, I can't just do this in my head necessarily. I highly recommend that you don't try and always do this in one step. This is 3 times 9x times 5, which is going to be 45 times 3, which is 135. So 27x cubed plus 135x. Oops, and this is a square. And you'll know when you're done if you made a mistake because it should go x cubed, x squared, x, and then no x's. So this one is 3 and another 3. I guess I could have written that as 9 and 25. So 25 times 9 is 225 x. And then 5 to the third is 125. If I had a choice between doing this or doing 3x plus 5 times 3x plus 5 times 3x plus 5. I personally like Pascal's triangle. Um, I like that I can know the coefficients. That's step one. Step two is counting down whatever the first term is and then counting up the other term. So it's pretty cool. We have one more to practice on. It's to the fourth. So I'm going to write out my five terms, one, two, three, four, five. And I know it's going to go one, four, six, four, one. I can see that from Pascal's triangle, one, four, six, four, one. So I already have my coefficients. And then I need my 4t to the fourth. And then my 4t, let me just put these pluses my 4t to the third, my 4t squared, my 4t, and this, this is really just a shortcut. Oh, no 4t is in the last one. Just a shortcut. So if you would like to actually multiply out 4t minus 2, you go for it. I'll see you on the other side. <laughs> 4t minus 2, 4t minus 2. That's what we're learning. We're learning a shortcut to do this using Pascal's triangle. Now be careful. Use the negative. It does play into the answer. So this is going to be no negative twos, one negative two, two negative twos, 
three negative twos and four negative twos. And you know you did it right if you get to four, your, your, your exponent is four. So if you accidentally started negative two here, you would have gotten to five and hopefully that would have alerted you that you made a mistake. Four to the fourth is 256 t to the fourth. So a lot of times what I tell kids they can do is they can do this as negative eight times and then four cubed is 64. Just something to show me how you did it. Because I'll tell you what the number one mistake is. The number one mistake is forgetting to cube the four. They just multiply the three numbers. So cube the four, that's the mistake, okay? So this is negative 512 T cubed. So I always just kind of write it down. This is four, it's negative two squared is four times um, six is 24 times 16. Just a little something underneath so that if you make a mistake, I have a better idea of where it comes from and can give you as much partial credit as possible. So this is gonna be 16 times negative eight. 16 times negative eight is negative 128t. Notice it's counting down t to the fourth, t to the third, t squared t, and this should have no t's. And it doesn't. Negative two to the fourth is 16. Okay, so that's how you use Pascal's triangle. So you'll have an opportunity. I will not say it's required, but I highly recommend that you do it. That's it for today. Have a great day.